right, we are going to be in Exodus 9 this morning, beginning in verse 20. We'll be looking at the fourth plague this morning, the Lord of the Flies. So you're turning there. Uh, please remember that in God's Word, He has given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. Exodus, did I say Exodus chapter 8, 9? I meant 8. Exodus chapter 8. Thank you. Exodus chapter 8, verse 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses throughout all the land of Egypt. The land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It would not be right to do so. For the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord the swarms of flies made apart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did, as Moses asked, and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. May God bless the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Father, here we are again on this Lord's Day, and we need the Lord who was God over Egypt to be with us this morning. Lord, we recognize that you do use human agents sometimes, but what is man but a waterer and a planter? Lord, you are the one that must give the growth, so we pray that you would grow us into a greater knowledge of who you are this morning that our hearts may be filled with the Holy Spirit, with joy and gladness and peace. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So thus far in the battle between Egypt and Israel, between Satan and God, we've seen three plagues unleashed. The Nile has been turned into blood, the frogs emerged from the underworld, and the dust turned into gnats. And this fourth plague marks the second cycle of plagues. They're in cycles of three, the tenth one being all by itself. In the first three plagues, The Egyptians were largely affected um, in their comfort. 
Here in Plagues 4 through 6, it's their persons and their property. So there's this progression of intensity and severity. In the first three plagues, it was both Egypt and Israel that was affected. But now, in the rest of these plagues, God makes a distinction, sparing His people. What's unique about this plague and the next one is that Yahweh performs this plague without the use of any means. Before it was Moses, do this. Aaron, do this. Stretch out your rod over this. But here, he doesn't use any means. It's just the Lord. Westminster Confession of Faith Chapter 5, paragraph 3, God in His ordinary providence makes use of means, yet He is free to work without, above, and against them at His pleasure. Now, why is this important to point out this morning? Because I know you, and I know me. Many of us right now are struggling with things in our life Because we have little means. Financially, perhaps, uh, there's more bills than money. This plague demonstrates that God doesn't need anything to perform His mighty works. Not one thing. He is free to deliver without the assistance of the paper in your wallet. What are you in need of, loved ones? Who are you looking to? God's hand has not become shortened that he cannot save. His ear has not grown dull that he cannot hear. If he controlled every fly in Egypt, certainly he can control every single circumstance, little buzzing circumstance in your life. So let's look at our... Outline As we progress forward, we're going to see three parts, the divine pursuer, the divine distinction, and then the divine deliverer. Let's begin. Verse 20, then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself. This is like, uh, put your flag in the ground and take your stand against Moses at the river. And remember, in the first plague, Pharaoh wasn't going down to the river merely to bathe or to get water. This was his altar where he worshipped his gods. And Pharaoh is going there again. And this so illustrates the doctrine of total depravity. Egypt already suffered three devastating plagues, and yet Pharaoh's heart was hard as iron. Like a dog returning to his vomit... Pharaoh is returning to his puny gods. Dear congregation, miracles, witnessing miracles cannot bring a person to repentance. These these false confessions out there today, well, if God just showed up, if I just saw God work, then I would believe. No, you would not. Remember, when the deceased rich man begged to have Abraham send Lazarus back to his brothers, um, Abraham responds, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. I think there was somebody that rose from the dead at one point, and they still didn't believe. Pharaoh did not repent, though he saw inconceivable miracles. Only the Holy Spirit, loved ones, can free a person from the bondage of sin. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. So Yahweh here instructs Moses what to say halfway through verse 20. Say to him, thus says the Lord, let My people go that they may serve me. This is the first, uh, this is the fifth time that this formula has been played out 
um, since the beginning of the book. In some form or another, let my people go that they may serve me, sacrifice to me, hold a feast to me. And the reason for the liberation here is the dominant theme, that they may serve me, be with me, glorify me, dwell with me. We're going to come back to that idea, so hold on to that. Here's what Yahweh threatens Pharaoh with if he doesn't obey. Verse 21, or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also on the ground on which they stand. Now, these insects apparently could both fly and crawl on the ground. And they were very destructive towards property. Verse 24 says that they ruined the land. I, I, I suspect that these were beetles. Uh, the, the Hebrew is ambiguous. It doesn't say swarms of flies. It just says swarms. Okay, The Egyptian beetle, um, as one commentator says, is very destructive. It inflicts severe bites and destroys clothes, books, and plants, and everything. Or maybe it was many different types of insects. Just every insect that you can imagine. Recall that these judgments weren't just neat tricks. They were judgments specifically against Egypt's deities. So, If these were beetles, um, dung beetles, no less, they would (laughs) lay their eggs in dung and then roll it up in a ball and move it across the earth, and they thought that that's how the sun worked, that the sun god Ray would move a boulder, move the sun across the sky and then put it on the other side of the horizon. If it was beetles, then it was against the god Kepra, who had a human form and the head of a a scarab beetle. He was the Egyptian god of resurrection. Or perhaps if it was flies, it was against the god Beelzebub, which means lord of the flies. His role, as one author wrote, was to protect Egypt's lands from swarms of flies and other natural disasters. And yet, what do we find? These gods couldn't do anything against Yahweh. Now, how awful would this plague have been? Uh, big bugs, small bugs, biting bugs, stinging bugs, crawling bugs, filthy dung bugs, bugs carrying disease. Children, boys and girls, um, when I was, well, some of your ages, one of your ages, I was sitting on my couch at home, relaxing, and this big spider crawled right across my lap. What do you think I did? Yeah, Exactly. Screamed, freaked out, ah! Maybe not that feminine, but... um, Can you imagine your lap being covered with bugs? And and the bugs are, are falling from the ceiling into your hair, and the walls are covered with bugs. The the Hebrew word uh, for great swarm is heavy. The air was heavy with bugs. You had to close your eyes to keep them from stinging your eyeballs. You had to probably hold a cloth over your mouth so that you wouldn't inhale them into your throat. This would have been absolute panic. It was panic. The empire of Egypt here was being overturned House by house, street by street, city by city. And that brings us to our first principle this morning, that God will do whatever it takes, including overturning empires, to bring us to himself. God will do whatever it takes to bring us to himself ever since the fall of man. God has had one aim, to bring his people back into Eden, to bring his people back into fellowship with him. And this is 
clearly seen in every major event in Scripture. Consider six proofs. Proof number one, the covenants. Loved ones, what's the goal of every single covenant? Why did God covenant with Abraham, with Noah, with Moses, with David? To bring us into an unbreakable binding relationship. Exodus 6, 7, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. Proof number two, the incarnation. Why did the Father send Jesus Christ in the flesh into this world? It's in his name. You shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God wants to be with us. Proof number three, Jesus' high priestly prayer. What did Jesus pray right before he went to the cross? John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. His prayer wasn't about how much he was going to suffer, but if he was going to get his prize. Proof number four, the atonement. Why did Jesus suffer for our sins? To bring us to God. First Peter 3, 8, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Proof number five, the second coming. <laughs> Why is Jesus going to come again? 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Don't you see that that's the beating heart of this first section in this passage? Verse 20, God says, let my people go that they may serve me. What does God want? Does he want mere freedom for his people? No, not at all. And this is where you need to grab a hold of yourself, dear Christian. Grab a hold of yourself this morning and remind yourself of why you are a Christian. Why did God make you a Christian? Just to free you from guilt? Did God make you a Christian just to, fear, to free you from the fear of death? No, those are great things, but that's not why God made you a Christian. God saved you so that you could dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of your life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to serve the Lord, to taste and see the Lord, to inquire of the Lord. Deliverance without being brought to the house of the Lord is no deliverance at all. Liberation and freedom and a guilt-free life and confidence in death by themselves can never satisfy your heart. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God put eternity into the hearts of men and the only thing that your heart can be satisfied with is if you have God, if you have the eternal, infinite, everlasting God. That's what he's doing in redemption, not merely freeing us, but bringing us back into Eden. So, dear friends, don't let your hearts be troubled this morning. Even if you forget the goal of your Christian life, even if you forget the goal of your salvation, God does not. Let my people go, he said, to sin and death and hell and the devil, that they may serve me. God's aim for our life is infinitely greater than the crumbs that we are scratching around for on the floor. And he will not stop. He's the hound of heaven. He is the great divine pursuer. And he will not stop until he brings you to himself. That's our first point, that God will do whatever it takes, including overturning empires to bring us to himself. Let's look secondly at the divine distinction. 
Now, something new occurs in this particular plague. In the first three plagues, Israel suffered right alongside of Egypt. Uh, Perhaps God was disciplining them for their idolatry. They were just as enamored with the gods of Egypt as the Egyptians. But in this plague, God does something new. Look at verse 22. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there. Let's stop right there. The land of Goshen was um, in the middle region of the land of Egypt. So Goshen, if you were in Goshen, Egypt would be uh, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. You were surrounded by Egypt, right? So children, boys and girls, imagine if you were to go home and start filling up your bathtub with water. And in the middle of the bathtub, a space, a perfect square of air that the water couldn't penetrate into was in the middle of that tub. That would be a miracle, wouldn't it? See, there's multiple miracles here. It's not just the swarm of these insects. It was the invisible fence that God had put around Goshen. And the main reason why God does this is the end of verse 22. Um, That you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. That you may know. You will see this miracle and you will know. See, we, we sang in the first song that God is immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. We can't see the invisible God. So how do we see him? Through his mighty works. Through his mighty works that he wrought on the earth. God set apart Goshen. He put this invisible fence around it so that all would know that he is the God above all other gods. Psalm 89, 5 and 6, Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Deuteronomy 3, 24, For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? God performed this miracle so that the world would know that there is no one like the Lord in the midst of the earth. But there's another reason that he sets Goshen apart. Look at verse 23. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. So the division is a sign. The division between Goshen and Egypt is a sign. It's a sign of what? It's a sign of redemption. Uh, The Hebrew word, if you look in your Bible, there's a little footnote by the word division, and it gives you the word redemption. Uh, Redemption is the price paid to free a slave or to clear up a debt. The division between Egypt and Goshen was a sign that the Hebrews were being redeemed from their bondage. The division was a sign that Israel no longer belonged to Pharaoh because God had redeemed them, and they now belong to him. Verse 24, and the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into the servants' houses throughout all the land of Egypt. The land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Flies. Ruined. The verb tense indicates a continuous action, which means the land was in the process of being ruined. There were still more plagues to come. This was the beginning of the ruin. Israel was in the process of redemption, but Egypt was in the process of ruin. And that brings us then to our second principle this morning is that throughout history, God makes a distinction between those who are His and those who are not. 
Throughout history, God makes a distinction between those who are his and those who are not. And this distinction is all over Scripture, isn't it? God made a distinction between Noah and his family and the rest of mankind. Noah, he saved on the ark. The rest of, the man, of mankind were drowned. God made a distinction between Abraham and the rest of the world. He pulled out Abraham out of Babylon to be the nation which would be the seed for the Messiah. God made a distinction even in the Babylonian captivity between his own people. There would be a basket of good figs and a basket of bad figs. The good figs he would preserve in Babylon and the bad figs he would destroy. And of course, this distinction is evidently clear at the last judgment when Christ himself separates the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. But what I want you to see is in our text, this distinction happens in history. It's not, we're not waiting for eternity for this distinction to take place. It happens now. Malachi 3, 18, then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Let's put some flesh on this. Children, boys and girls, children of the church, God has, makes, God makes a distinction with you. He made a distinction between you and the children of the world. And it's a most wonderful distinction. 1 Corinthians 7.14 says that you are holy children, meaning that you are set apart. Oh, what a privilege that is that perhaps you don't even know it. The children of the world, they are discipled in darkness, and you are discipled in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The children of the world are discipled in schooled in evil things, and you are schooled in the Holy Spirit. The children of the world have the devil as their father, but you come in here and you have God as your father. Don't take it for granted. Don't despise your birthright. Cling to the Lord in faith. Praise Him for the unspeakable mercy that you were born into the covenant. And this doctrine of course, is a great comfort for every Christian. This distinction is seen in so many ways. We could do a whole sermon on this. Consider the distinction that you have, loved ones, of the peace that you have that the wicked do not have. You have a peace that passes all understanding. The wicked, Isaiah 57, 20 and 21 says, they have no peace. They are like the sea that is tossed to and fro. The only time they have peace is when they're unconscious. Consider the distinction between your prayers and the prayers of the wicked. Do you know that God hears your prayers? Proverbs 15, 29 says, the Lord hears the prayer of the righteous, but he doesn't hear the prayer of the wicked. John 9, 31. Consider the distinction between the spirit that resides in you and the spirit that resides in the world. You have the fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. The wicked have been given over to the works of the flesh. They're slaves of the evil one, and God threatens that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Think about the distinction that happens to you when evil things occur. God has given you a great promise when evil things happen to you that he has not given it all to the, to the wicked. He says that all things work together for the good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. He takes every evil thing, every hard thing, and he redeems it. No such promise is given to the wicked. In fact, the scripture says that they're storing up wrath for the day of God's righteous judgment. Perhaps someone's here this morning and you're saying, but I'm a Christian. I don't see this distinction at all. I am suffering worse than many non-Christians I know. I'm in greater need. I'm under greater distress. I'm under greater sorrow than many on the outside. And if that's you, I, I would just say, your friend, 
they are saying, don't judge the matter too quickly. Joseph suffered in prison, and then he was brought to the right hand of Pharaoh. Jonah was swallowed by the whale, and then he became the deliverer of the gospel to a whole city. Naomi lost her husband and her two sons, and then she became the matriarch of the Messiah. Don't judge the matter too quickly. Christ didn't only suffer, he also was raised from the dead, and you too will be raised up. You too will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You too will be comforted. That's our second point, that God always makes a distinction between those who are His and those who are not. Let's look finally at the divine deliverer. Egypt was here in the process of being ruined. In verse 25, Pharaoh begins to relent. Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. Now notice the sorcerers are not called this time. Uh, They've already shown to be impotent. And it seems at first that Pharaoh is conceding. Go sacrifice to your God. But then he adds, within the land. You see, this is what the unconverted man attempts to do in every single age. They try to compromise with God. They offer God a third way, a middle ground. God commanded that Israel be set free to serve him in the wilderness. And Pharaoh tries to negotiate by saying, oh, you can serve God in Egypt. Perhaps you're like Pharaoh this morning. You're an unconverted man. You know what God requires of you, but you're trying to compromise. You're trying to offer a halfway obedience. Okay, God, I'll obey you. I'll sacrifice to you, but but I'm going to do it in Egypt. I'm going to do it in the world, like the world does it. Dear friend, God will not share your heart. He doesn't share his throne. He doesn't share the rule of the universe. He doesn't share... His glory. He must have all of you or or none of you. 1 John 2.15 says, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Matthew 6.24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Pharaoh in this story showed that he loved his rights more than he loved God's rights. So, dear unconverted friend, whose rights do you love more, yours or God's? You see, you must relinquish your rights to the Lord of heaven and meet Him in heaven or retain your own rights and go to hell. God never, ever compromises. And that's precisely how Moses answers. Look at verse 26. But Moses says it would not be right to do so. No, is what Moses is saying. For the offerings that we sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. He's first concerned with God's name, his worship, being reproached by the Egyptians. He's concerned that God's worship will be, re- will be scorned. But he's also concerned about the people 
If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? The Egyptians worshipped these beasts that the Israelites were going to sacrifice. And so their worship would probably end in bloodshed, in a civil war, which is perhaps what Pharaoh wanted. So Moses says in verse 27, we must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. And and dear friends, we've spent much time talking about Moses' failures, but here Moses absolutely shines. He is a brilliant example of the man who refuses to compromise with the world, and we need to imitate this every day. Brother, sister, child, you and I, we face choices to compromise with the world. We face choices to compromise with what God commands from us. And sometimes these choices can seem very reasonable. Pharaohs seem very reasonable. You can worship the Lord, just do it over here. You can worship your God, just do it out of the way. But it's never, ever reasonable to give up even one command that the Lord our God has given us. And you might be called fanatical, you might be ridiculed, you might be scorned, but let's let's look at the score sheet here. God turns water into blood, He calls frogs from the underworld, He turns dust into lice, and He can call an army of insects. What has Pharaoh been able to do? Who's fanatical? Moses who obeys the Lord or Pharaoh who returns to his vomit. You are not fanatical, loved ones, if you don't compromise. You are reasonable. You are faithful. When Pharaoh saw that Moses wouldn't budge, he says in verse 28, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Pharaoh at least halfway concedes the point, and the bugs are so unbearable that he asks Moses to pray, to plead. Verse 29, then Moses said, Behold, I'm going out from you, and I will plead. With the Lord. But the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. Moses prayed, the Lord listened, Moses prayed, and every single bug, small bug, big bug, crawling bug, flying bug, left Egypt. And their disappearance on the next day was just as sudden as their arrival. And this is different than the other plagues. Remember, the river of blood was there for seven days. The frogs died, but then they had to heap them up into these big stinky piles. And it doesn't even say anything about the disappearance of the gnats. They probably just slowly died. But here, there's an immediacy. Not one remained. The land was cured just as quickly as it was plagued. And so we arrive then at our third principle. Loved ones, when the Lord cures, He cures completely, immediately, and irrevocably. This is exactly how we see Jesus healing in the Gospels everywhere. Matthew 8, 3, and immediately His leprosy was cleansed. Not one spot remained. Luke 8, 44, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Not one drop of blood remained. 
Mark 5, 13, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and they were drowned in the sea. Not one demon of Legion's army remained. Dear friends, this is what Jesus does in his true and better exodus. When Christ was crucified on the tree, he cured you of every single sin that afflicts you, that stings you, that harasses you, that invades you, that troubles you, that gives you sorrow, that has shipwrecked your life. Every sin, he immediately and completely and irrevocably removes the penalty. No penalty. And you might say, well, that's fine and dandy, Pastor Josh, but I still sin now. Well, that's true. And you and I will still sin until Jesus brings us home. But consider what you've heard this morning. What sin will stop you from entering into his rest? If that's the goal of all of history is to dwell in the house of the Lord, to ascend to the mount of the Lord, what sin can stop you? Not one sin has remained. They were all nailed to the cross. And better yet, the sins that you still commit, there's a distinction that's made between your sins and the sins of the world. God will cause your sins miraculously, majestically to work for your good. Even the sins that that most trouble you, the sins that habitually haunt you, God, in his almighty power and his almighty wisdom, has made a distinction between those sins and the sins of the world. He will make them work for your good. None of God's wrath remains. Not one ounce of terror remains. Every wrong was punished on the sun and buried in the grave. The Lord has done it all. Not one sin is left on your record. If you're you're here this morning and your heart is like Pharaoh's, if it's hardened, if you're always wanting to bargain with the Lord, if you're always wanting your own rights as opposed to His, please hear the word of the Lord. Being unconverted means that God has made a distinction between you and His people. And right now, you're on the outside, you're in the process of ruin. And if you refuse to hear his voice, you'll be subject to everlasting ruin. Turn to Jesus Christ. He alone can remove the plague of sin. He offers forgiveness this morning. Everlasting forgiveness, an everlasting dwelling place in the house of the Lord. And this is what's required of you. That if you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and God will remove every last sin. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the exodus Lord, we thank you for the true and better exodus in the person of your Son. God, we thank you that no sin remains on our account. That just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, that through the second Adam, Christ, sin has been cured. And that we can stand before you as broken as we are before you this morning and know that you will stop at nothing to bring us into your presence. And so we praise you. May all the angels in heaven praise you. May all the sea creatures below praise you. May every bird and beast praise you. May every nation bring praise to you for you alone are worthy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.